like what other show puts their characters through the ringer this much? I mean, it's it's crazy, but um, yeah, I think, you know, at the end of this season, you know, this family is together, but they're fractured, absolutely. You know, the cracks are still there, you know, they, they are united uh, and about to face this, you know, this this storm ahead, but um, but yeah, they're, they're in no ways completely healed from it. Do you ever feel as if everything's pointing you towards something? Space, time, history? Time has come for you to fulfill your oath. Do not disappoint me. If there is a war, it would be safer in your time. You want to go back, don't you? Our family is here. You are my family. If I am to keep people safe here, I need to know what's causing their illnesses. Isn't this playing God? I swore an oath to the crown, but I will not stand by and watch my kin killed. People consider this to be the spark of the American Revolution. If we stop this fight now, America will never become America. Promise, Jamie. Promise me you're coming back. We can't say what might befall us. Just as you give me your word, I give you mine. Stand by my hand. What kind of world is this? The only world. No, it isn't. Welcome to Paley Fest LA. Hi, I'm Kate Hahn from TV Guide Magazine and TV Insider. And I'm delighted to be your host for this very special Paley Fest conversation honoring Outlander. And thanks to the festival's official card, City, for helping to make this event possible. This program is presented by the Paley Center for Media, a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring excellence in television through education programs, great conversations with stars and storytellers of critically acclaimed series like the one we celebrate today, and the preservation of television's creative legacy at the Paley Archive. To learn more and to become a member, please visit paleycenter.org. Thank you. And today we are thrilled to welcome the members of the gifted cast and creative team of STARS and Sony Pictures Television's acclaimed series, Outlander. Joining us are Diana Gabaldon, Matt Roberts, Meryl Davis, Richard Rankin, Sophie Skelton, Sam Hewn, and Katrina Balfe. Welcome everyone, thank you so much. <laughs> we all felt we had to wave there, right? <laughs> You can leave anytime, anytime. <laughs> um, the, the first question is on behalf of Paley Fest sponsor, City, and they would love to, to know. Uh, the show has an incredibly dedicated fan base. What are some things that make the show's fans connect so passionately with it? And I'd love to start with Kat and Sam on this because you've been the core characters since season one. So what are your, what is your take on that? Kat, do you want to start? Um, well, I mean, first of all, Diana created this incredible world and these incredible characters. And I think we were so lucky that there was already such a huge fan base um, built in because of that. And I think what we've built upon and tried to go forward with is that it's just this incredible love story at the center of, of this, this world. But, it breaks out into all these other amazing things. You know, it's got so much action and drama. And I just think it sort of has something for everybody, but at the heart of it is this incredible aspirational love story. Yeah, I think uh, Katrina obviously has absolutely answered that question. I mean, it's all down to to the woman that's below me right now, somehow uh, in this strange Zoom world. <laughs> but uh, we can cut that out. But um, yeah, yeah Diana Gabaldon, you know, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, 
fantastic you know world and you know we've ex we've obviously you know tried to stick as close as we can to to her books and um and it never it never stands still you know we we've gone from scotland you know in, in the 1700s with the you know the jacobite revolution we found ourselves in versailles and uh, the caribbean and then in america now now we're dealing with you know the the the, the revolutionary war and the big sort of the beginnings of modern america so it's it really does it as katrina says it, it um spans over many different genres um, but at the heart of it is is this great love story, uh, and not only Jamie and Claire, but the other characters involved as well. Right. I'm, I'm curious. Um, you know, Bree and uh, uh, Roger c came in later. So um, Sophie and Richard, what are what is your take? What what has the fan reaction been? Um, do you communicate with fans? Why do you think they're so passionate about the show? Sophie, we can start with you. Yeah, again, I mean, absolutely building on what Sam of Katrina said in terms of just the base of the show, um, given that you've got the history element in there, you've got the drama element, this beautiful love story, there's just so much in there for everyone. But I do think giving a different, um, a different relationship in there too has helped because I think Jamie and Claire have this beautiful idealistic love story. Um, obviously they have their moments like any relationship, but I think Roger and Brianna have given a very different relationship for people to look at. Um, which I think in some ways is almost, in some ways a more realistic one in that they're not great at communicating, they, they have their moments, they have their arguments, and sometimes their arguments really pull them apart, but I think that that has brought maybe a new generation of fans in, um, and also just gives people two completely different relationships to root for. So yeah, you have this beautiful idealistic romance, and then you have maybe what some people would see as a slightly more relatable, realistic one, and actually there's just there's just a bit in there, like they said, a bit for everyone and just kind of every, all different scenarios and all different ways of dealing with relationships or anything is in there. And I think also with all the characters, I think one thing that Diana did beautifully and that the writers keep doing beautifully is that the characters aren't perfect and it's so easy in TV shows and film to just see these almost heroic characters all the way through, but actually all of the characters have their flaws and have their moments. And I think that that just makes it all more relatable too. And people just really connect with that. Richard? Do you have anything to add to that? No. <laughs> Richard's, too, Richard's too busy boozing. I am absolutely. I think everything that the guys have just said, all of that is great. Um, no, I mean, the show was already like full steam ahead when I, I feel anyway, when, when Sophie and I uh, uh, joined. So it was kind of like we just we just kind of jumped on board and it was great and it was an amazing experience. And I think we, well, I, was, well, I sort of got swept up by that. and you know, um, it already had such an amazingly passionate, loyal fan base when we came on. And the, the great thing about the show is it is always kind of evolving. It's always moving. It's always tackling difficult subjects. And, you know, there's always, you know, new relationships being forged. And um, the story's constantly, like, touching on what Sam said, I think one of the, the things that I really love most about Orlando is, is, is how it's constantly changing scene, how we can go from the Highlands of Scotland to, you know, high society, Paris, to the Caribbean, to... To, to, uh, to where we are now, which is just preceding the American Revolution. And I think that just constantly keeps it fresh. So it's, it constantly feels like it's moving um, and never really gets stale because of that. So, um, yeah, I think our fan base have always really been behind us because of those reasons, really. And uh, Sophie and I only came on and really made it worse, to be honest. <laughs> These guys did all the hard work and we just popped in and rode on the coattails. So thanks, thanks everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, when you created these two couples, these pairs of, of couples, were you thinking what um, the actors have just said, that you wanted to create this contrast between these two couples? Oh, no. Um, see, I don't actually create characters. I kind of find them. And then uh, we add layers as they come along. You know, some characters like Jamie and Claire, I, I understand them immediately, but they get kind of more pungent and rich as we work together. Uh, me in the book that is and you know the actors that take it on to another another layer or two or three uh, but uh, no um, Brianna and uh, and Roger sort of came about well Roger came about accidentally because I needed somebody to go back in history and find something for Claire and then we had Brianna uh, because you know, an Claire was pregnant yeah. <laughs> yeah. you're just no, an accident you see no it was an accident <laughs> <laughs> she was, yes. Really. Uh, no, she, uh, but she existed only because Claire was pregnant at the end. So it took me a little while to uh, to figure her out, you know, to find out who she was. She's what I call a hard nut. People that I just have to live with for a while and they sort of beat on them and eventually they crack open and 
show you themselves, which she did. But uh, because of this sort of gradual discovery of their characters, they, uh, they came to life somewhat differently. Um, and also they are part of Jamie and Claire's relationship as well. Because Rihanna, of course, grew up with uh, Claire being married to, uh, to another man who she's always called her father. So she's naturally going to be kind of ambivalent when she meets Jamie Fraser and when she hears about him saying, that's not my father. I have a perfectly good father. What are you talking about? So, you know, that, uh, that is that kind of relationship, a girl's relationship with her father is going to affect her marriage, her choice of mate, how she gets along with said mate. And uh, Brianna's had a much different background than Claire did. And so her marriage is going to be different too, regardless of who she marries. As it is, right. luckily she got a nice patient guy. <laughs> And, and, yeah, but it, it's that they just develop that way. It's not that I, you know, lay them out on the ground and go, Shazam, you know, rise up and act. You know, it, uh, they're just there. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, Matt, um, speaking of what's gone on in the past season, we, you know, we started with this wonderful wedding. Everyone was very happy, but of course it's Outlander, so things typically began to fracture, fall apart. Um, what was the overall arc or theme of this season for you when you were writing it? Uh, well, it's it's kind of we always start with the books and we try to find the the main theme in the in the book. And um, Fiery Cross is is a very big book. Thank you, Diana. There's a lot of great scenes. There's a lot of great things that happen throughout the book. But what the one thing that kind of came off of season four was that building of a home, and then in, in, to kind of condense the book down into twelve episodes, we thought what what would the what would this family do that just created this home? How what lengths would they go to to protect it, protect their family, protect their uh, the ones they love? And and that seemed to be the thing that kind of surfaced when we first started breaking the book. And that's how we kind of mapped out the season. And and what was so great about it is the scenes from the book kind of just you know dropped right into place throughout those twelve episodes. So it was. Um, it, it worked out really nicely for us because there's so many dynamic scenes that we could draw from that show, you know, conflict and, and strife and, you know, pain and suffering, you know, people, the things that, that uh, uh, the fans of Outlander come for as, as, as well as the love story. And I think that's what binds it all together, the, the love stories now. You did a fantastic job lining it up as well. Yeah, the oh, writers you. And, and you, and naturally the actors as well, that season five was just terrific. Mm, thank you. It, it was yeah, a spectacular yeah. season. And, and part of that too was um, a lot of the production, a lot of the settings we saw. So Meryl, I'm curious about, you know, maybe you could talk about how you keep the show fresh looking. We've heard from the actors about how you're constantly changing locations, you're getting a new look for the show. How do you keep it exciting in, in that way? Well, I mean, I think every, every, oh, sorry, Sam, were you going to pop in? No, I was just going to say, you're going to recast <laughs> each season, basically. <laughs> exactly. Well, Jamie and Claire are getting a little long in the tooth, um, <laughs> but, um, but they look so young. Um, but uh, I mean, every year, honestly, and, and I think Richard kind of touched on this already, but, um, you know, this is a traveling show. Every year is something different. Every book is brings something unique to the table, and it's a challenge every year, and I think it, it keeps both the fans on their toes, but it also keeps us on our toes um, and our crew. And I think it's one of the reasons we've retained so much of our crew as we've come forward. Um, you know, we are a family at, at the heart of the show, but it's also exciting. It's exciting to be on the show because there's something new every year. And, and the same thing for our production team. You know, Gary Steele is spectacular at every year creating something that just kind of tops itself. And, um, and, you know, with the big house, you know, we started started last year it, it kind of came into its own this year and um it is literally a big house um but it, it's spectacular and um everything you know brownsville everything he creates with his team is just kind of pushes pushes forward um what we've already created and and kind of tops it and, and i feel like we continue to do that every year both with the material and also the surroundings as well as trisha bigger we have a new costume designer this year and and I think she stepped in some very big stepped into some very big shoes this year with with Terry having left, and she's really kind of created her own mood. She's kind of ta taken up the mantle where where Terry left, and and um, you know the look is is different but the same. And I just think every year we just keep topping ourselves, and you know we keep saying, oh, last year was the toughest year. Oh, 
seen year was the toughest year and every year it becomes, oh, this is going to be the toughest year. And we keep thinking, oh, because we're in America now, it's going to be easier, but it, it just keeps getting harder. But I think that's what makes us all love it and want to come to work every day and, and uh, strive to do our best both for ourselves, but also for the fans who are expecting that. Well, one of those new spectacular sets is Claire's surgery. So Kat, I wanted to ask you, what's it like working in that surgery and, and what did you have to learn um, about medicine this season that was new? Um, well, apparently penicillin looks like a paintbrush. <laughs> um, no, I, I love that set and it's incredible. You know, we, we sort of are very lucky that we get to do like a little walkthrough beforehand and it's amazing to have the conversations with our awesome prop team as well, where you're going through and it's, you know, I, I'm a little OCD and, you know, it's sort of like, well, I think Claire would have these things set up this way. And, and, you know, it's really fun that you get to sort of create this little world for Claire. And especially when we were doing all the penicillin stuff, it's like, well, how do you think she would arrange all of this? And um, it's, it's just, it's beautiful. And it just helps you so much as an actor when you have such a rich environment to step into that feels so real. And, you know, you open up any drawer and there's an instrument or there's a piece of, you know, Claire's either note taking or, or something like that. And it's just those little details that are so vital, I think, to giving you just such a, a rich tapestry to work with. Um, and, you know, we also have an incredible uh, medical advisor, our, our real Dr. Claire. Um, and, you know, she's been with us from the very beginning and she's been amazing. And, you know, when we had to do the tonsillectomy, she was incredible by, you know, walking me through all of that. And, um, you know, when, when it was the appendectomy and doing the autopsy and stuff like that, walking through all of those things, it's just fascinating. And it's also because, you know, it's make believe it doesn't really, you know, it's fun. You can poke around and pretend you're <laughs> doing things, but you know, you're not actually going to kill somebody. So it's good. Well, you guys also mentioned that there are, and Matt said this, there are so many moments of high stakes and drama. And, and one of those was uh, when Sam, uh, you, your character, Jamie, was bitten by a snake. So tell us what it was like to shoot that scene. You're, you're out there uh, with Roger, who's not a very experienced frontiersman at that point, um, camping. What was it like to shoot that kind of snake bite scene? And both of you guys can talk about this. Yeah, I mean, you know, so coming off the back of probably one of the 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 strongest storylines I think Jamie's had, um, which you know possibly wasn't in Diana's books, but it's definitely part of her world. Um, one of the times we detoured from that, but I think it was a really rewarding for myself and for, I think for fans as well. It was the death of uh, Jamie's godfather, um, Murta, and I think. You know, so so for me, that was a really big moment. And I think for Jamie, it was a huge moment. And actually for the whole family, the repercussions have felt, you know, for, for many episodes afterwards. And so the snake bite came out of, out of you know, here we are now, it's Outlander. And then there's another challenge, you know, that here's a, a really uh, strong moment where Jamie has to, to confront his own mortality. And just going back to what Katrina said about, um, or about, you know, the people that work in the background, you know, so we worked with the, um, the makeup department and the makeup department is equally as, as sort of um, in depth and, and um, hardworking as, as the other departments. And, you know, we have all these amazing surgeries or grotesque prosthetics that we have to wear and, and use. And just to be part of that conversation, you know, to talk about, you know, what does it look like? What, what happens to your body when, when you get bitten by a snake? What happens to, to the wound? And, and we had these really uh, amazing prosthetics that we used um, throughout that story. But yeah, and then Jamie finds himself, you know, in the forest uh, with the man that he thinks is probably not worthy of being his, his daughter's husband, um, a man that he thinks is not suited to, to this world in this time period. Um, and he's he's confronted with that and actually surprised by by um, by Roger's um, fortitude and Roger's uh, his own unique way of looking at the world. Well, tell us about tell us about Murtaugh. I do want to talk about that. You know, tell us about what it was like to shoot that scene where he actually loses him, where Jamie loses his godfather. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so it was. Um, it, it's kind of hard to to really. Um, put it into words really you know we have this amazing actor in Duncan McQuarrie who 
Um, he's just been a really strong part of the storyline. Murta, the character, has obviously always been there for Jamie. He's been this silent guardian, this father figure. Uh, but Duncan, as an actor, has been probably our, our best friend and chief entertainer on set. And, you know, the man who'll probably be also drinking the most whiskey when we're doing one of these. But um, he really is a lot of fun, but also a really, really incredible actor. And, and to lose him that day was, uh, you know, was... was um, yeah, it was quite traumatic for Jamie. And so then, yeah, there was this journey of Jamie coming to terms with, you know, through that, through grief. So it's, you know, um, first of all, it's, it's a shock and then there's, um, there's anger and there's, you know, all these, all these stages of grief. And then basically we get to, to the tent and, uh, and Claire cannot help him. And he realizes that, that he's lost his, his godfather. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was just some really great writing, to be honest, you know, because then Jamie is confronted with Governor Try and then, and out comes Jamie's uh, emotion, Jamie's grief. Um, and it was interesting. We actually had to go back and, and shoot um, some of that stuff there, which um, again, you know, is, is an acting challenge, I think. Uh, but, you know, we have great writing, we have great directors and, you know, and, and a great supporting cast as well. Not Roger, the, the guy that plays Roger's <laughs> brothers. I completely. <laughs> wow. Wow. Sophie, I wanted to talk about Bree's journey a bit because she has quite the season and she finally, I mean, would you say with what happens with Stephen Bonnet that she, she overcomes what happened to her with him? Tell, tell us a little bit about her journey this season and, and how she copes with that trauma. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think even in the end of the season, you know, you can you can put a bullet in the man, but you can't put a bullet in what happened. And I think obviously Brianna spends the season trying to overcome it and trying to be happy and almost put it to one side. But it, it is a trauma that will be with her for the rest of her life. But I do think it's something that she has managed to, in that very Fraser-like strong way, she's managed to squash it um, in terms of an outward uh, showing of her grief, I suppose. And it's definitely something that haunts her. I think Jemmy has been a very welcome distraction. She's been able to put all of her energy into taking care of a child as opposed to um, sort of dwelling with her own demons. And I think that's one thing we sort of played on this season where it's almost like Brianna can't sleep, which I suppose in a way is good because I know Jemmy doesn't sleep. Um, and I think sleeping is when her demons seep back in. So I definitely think that she's had to put her own healing in a way aside and just put all of her focus on Jemmy. Um, but obviously, you know, we see when we have the wedding in the first episode, we see initially quite a nervous Brianna. I don't think it's quite how she would have envisaged at her, her wedding. I think obviously Frank's not there, which is just an added um, piece of trauma. She lost her father quite young. Um, but also getting married in the 17th century in front of this whole clan of people from the rich who she doesn't really know is quite, quite a nerve wracking show, I think. So initially, it's not quite how she would do it. She'd probably just elope in the 70s and have quite a relaxed, fun wedding with her close family and friends. But um, yeah, we pick up with her quite nervous. And then obviously, we see this very happy, relaxed Brie, she and Roger dancing, her talking with her mom, with her father, looking after Jemmy, doing the mashed potato and all of that. And then all of a sudden, yeah, hearing Bonnet, hearing that he's alive, it all just comes crumbling down again. And that is just something that really in a way brings the trauma back, not that it particularly went anywhere, but um, knowing that he's alive just poses more of an imminent danger as much as a reminder of what happened. Um, because then obviously it's, it's that mama bear mode and her son is then in imminent danger knowing that Bonnet is lurking around, especially given the fact that he gave her the gem in season four. We know that he potentially has some interest in getting to know Jemmy or harming Jemmy or whatever. And, Obviously, um, when you've gone through a trauma, then any reminder of it, it's always going to be the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario that would come to Bree's mind is that Bonnet would want to take her child or harm her child or harm her family again. So it's really something that she then carries with her, obviously on a deeper level, that's a given, but then on a more, a more surface level throughout the season, you know, even when she sees that Jemmy's gone missing and she just automatically, her mind goes to that, that worst case scenario. And so it is only when we get to episode 10 where she finally has somewhat of a form of closure obviously like i say the trauma is never gone but at least now she knows that the that the man and the imminent danger is gone she can just for all intents and purposes live her life and obviously i'm sure there's moments where it will seep in again but there is there is some element of healing there knowing that that man has had had some justice done exactly and i want to talk about the way trauma was handled this season um in the writing and the shooting and, and matt if you could speak to that there were a couple of very experimental uh, filmic styles that we haven't seen in Outlander before. And I'm thinking of Rogers Hanging 
And then in the finale where Claire experiences a severe trauma and we sort of are transported to another time, how did you make the decision to handle Outlander visually differently than we'd seen before to handle these traumatic scenes? Well, you know, we, we started the season early on knowing that one of the big, one of the big challenges for us in the writing room is, uh, this is the books is that you're in the characters heads. And I think that's one of the things the, the fans get used to of reading these books, you get into the characters heads, you, you know, their thoughts, you know what they're thinking in any given moment. Um, because Diana writes them and we've we've run in we we've run out of voiceover it's hard to just have uh, as, as Kat and Sam can probably attest to early on in 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 filming in season one we would stop we would you know Margaret our, our script supervisor would hit the clock for 45 seconds and everybody would stand there and we go okay that's where the voiceover goes and we realized that you just can't do that over and over and over again because that is is some of the great internal dialogue from the book we wanted to get out so we were we we've always kind of struggled with that it's always been a challenge and so this season we thought how can we get into their heads visually and these were the two as these were the two episodes episode uh eight and episode 12 where we thought we could visualize it and we needed to kind of step out of ourselves a little bit but do justice to the to uh, the the story as well. So getting into Roger's head in that silent picture mode gave it a different visual than just showing a flashback. And, you know, it took us a long time in editing to, to really put that together and structure it well. What we do is we tend to kind of overwrite that stuff. So when you read a script, you might go, wow, that's a lot of stuff. But we know that we're going to, in post, just come down and, and cut it down to its bare essentials because that's all you need to tell the story. Our fans are very astute. They get the point, they get things and uh, they can fill, you know, certainly the book readers fill in the gaps with what they've already read. And that's a luxury. It's both like a gift and a curse for us, you know, because sometimes we don't have to tell everything visually and they fill in the gap. And then other times they're like, hey, where's the gap that I wanted to see that I've been waiting 20 years for? So it's it's uh it's a juggle if we juggle with that all the time but those those two elements were picked out early in the season you know early in the writing and we decided let's let's see how this works now with episode eight we actually filmed both ways the we we had um uh, the studio and network were a little concerned that the silent picture wouldn't wouldn't you know wouldn't reveal itself the way they they you know they couldn't get their head around it on the page. And we uh, uh, we thought we could get our heads around it. So we filmed it both ways and we asked the actors to do it both ways. And that was, uh, you know, challenging for them to both play a, a regular flashback and then go into silent picture mode. So um, we had to double up uh, with the filming of it. So, you know, kudos to them. They really uh, stepped up and, and dug into that. I think Richard in that episode is, uh, you know, phenomenal. He, he played both sides of that, you know, both the silent picture part. And then he goes in, you know, being, he, he, I don't know how many times you were hanged, Richard, but it, it feels like about a thousand. He's um, still in silent picture mode. Yeah. <laughs> and we only really had to do a couple, but we just had so much fun kicking the barrel over and hanging them over and over again. So we just kept doing it. So. Now, um, how was that scene to shoot, Richard? Oh, I didn't do it. It was stuntman that did it. <laughs> oh. that, that, that's not fair. No, that's not true. There was a, there You're was not a supposed to tell people that. No, a, um, I, I jest. There was a lot surrounding the hanging, um, both um, on location and in the studio. There were, there were many, many, many elements to it. And I think like Matt was saying, um, you know, the difficulty of editing that together because they had so much content and how they would tell that story and how they would sort of get that sort of um, the impression of being, you know, inside Roger's head and, 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 and having the story told from really quite a difficult perspective, I think, especially when you're working with kind of a, me a mediocre actor to really convey that. But um, no, we were in the studio and I remember particularly one of the hardest things to shoot, I think all season, was they had this, this special lens, maybe Matt can remember the name of it. There's a really, really long sort of narrow lens. It was like, it felt like it was about eight foot long coming out of this camera and into the sack, which was, you know, obviously 
covering my face. And we shot that in the studio, which was just just prior to being hung. So just before the barrel was kicked away. And we shot that a lot. And that was quite difficult to shoot. And that was really quite, and, and, and trying to tell that story from in a really, really confined, confined space with this, you know, lens literally about, you know, maybe five centimetres away from your, your eyeballs. That, that was quite tricky. So there were many elements uh, of it shot and it was all very difficult. And you do have to be kind of in that really tense sort of, I suppose, well, edge of the barrel moment of, you know, just about to be uh, hung and everything that comes with that. So I think they did an amazing job. I think the director, Stephen Wolfen, and I think the way that he shot it and the way he went about it and how everyone stuck to that visual of, of the um the the silent movie thing because I loved that from the start but it is a it's risky it's bold but I think you need to be that way in television don't you to have more sort of, it's more exciting that way and I think that everyone really did a, a really really great job assembling that because it, it wasn't easy and it was risky um but yeah well th- another very bold choice was the scene with Cat and you know you know your kidnapping and attack. Uh, by these men who had kidnapped you. And, um, y- you know, Claire's disassociating by flashing to this imaginary 1960s Thanksgiving. Did you shoot the Thanksgiving uh, scenes first so that you would be able to visualize those while you were shooting the later scenes of the attack? How did that work? Um, God, I'm trying to remember which went first. I think... We, we, I filmed, we filmed a little a little chunk of... of uh, you know, after after the the abduction, and then we went in for like a week and a half. Remember, in the in the modern house. Yeah. So that was. But then I think the actual night shoots that we did maybe was after that. Yeah. At yes. the end. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, you know, that was again. It was it was a really great script, and you know, I think it took time for everyone to sort of understand and to sort of arrive on the same page. But we had, you know, a really strong script and Jamie Payne, our director, was incredible. And he had a really, I mean, I, I know he was talking with Matt all the time and he had a really strong visual sort of plan mapped out. And, you know, we, he talked a lot about different artists and, and this sort of surrealist photographer, Gregory Crudson and different things like this. And it was just getting it all to sort of fit I think was the challenge but it was really you know it was amazing by the end of the season that everyone was trying so hard to do something that was going to be visually very different and stylistically very different and you know and it was also as important that you're taking you know Claire which is all of our beloved character and you're you know she's going through something so harrowing and it was trying to find you know what wh- how what happens to a woman like that who is so strong and so resourceful and has been through so much in her life but yet enduring this is brought to almost breaking point and it was it was just a it was a great challenge for me and I think it was a great challenge for the entire crew and everyone else in that episode um and I think you know it it it, all those risks sort of paid off and, and it ended up being quite beautiful but I think it was really, it was a great idea that, you know, when Matt came and talked to us about using this disassociative state, um, I thought that that was really a powerful thing to try and explore. Um, And it was just about finding sort of the right ways of doing it. And and I think, yeah, we we sort of got there in the end. When you say it was challenging for you in any particular way? Um, Well, just as an actor, you know, anyone, who's gone through subject matter like that, it's always difficult. Um, you want, you know, it's, it's really hard to do, to address these subjects and, and feel that you're on the right path. And, and, you know, you're always trying to toe the line between being responsible and not bringing anything that's overly gratuitous or trying to, trying to show too much with also being very true to the situation and trying to respect the, the, the subject matter. Um, and just, you know, the, the surrealism element of it, I thought was really interesting. And it was for me, you know, and I think with, with Matt and Tony, we sort of had gone back and forth with this and it was sort of, I wanted to make sure that when we were in these disassociative states that we were always 
in Claire's mind. And so it was from Claire's perspective. And, you know, I didn't want her to be talking too much. And, you know, we, I think that was the, the thing about all of us finding the right, what felt right for all of us um, about what that would look like. I mean, how do you, how do you show what, she, what Claire is sort of experiencing in her head? Um, but I think, you know, through, it was an amazing team effort. And I think we all, we all found a, a really good way of doing it in the end. Well, and when she comes, she comes home to Fraser's Ridge. And I believe the last line of the, the season is safe, which is her answer to Jamie about how she feels. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, Sam, what, what is Jamie's responsibility to Claire after this trauma that she's been through? What, what is he... What is he thinking about their relationship and, and what he needs to do for her? Yeah, I mean, just like thinking about what's happened this season to all these characters. And Jamie, you know, having been through trauma himself, kind of understands, he knows he needs to be there for her, he needs to support her, but he also, um, he also can't, um, he also has to respond to what, what Claire needs. And I think it was interesting, we, we talked a lot about, you know, physical touch and when he can actually feel like he can touch her. And I think, you know, we focus in on that in the last scene on, you know, Jamie and Claire are holding hands. And um, it's, it's so interesting that all these characters have been through so much trauma, not only this season, but, but over all the seasons. And um, yeah, they have each other, but ultimately uh, they're about to probably face even bigger challenges in, in subsequent seasons when Matt starts writing them. <laughs> He's already written them. Matt's probably <laughs> at work already. Well, I mean, you know, Richard, your character, Roger, probably, I think he might have had the biggest arc as far as changing it from one sort of person into another. Um, you know, he, he's killed by the end of the season. And at the beginning, he just wanted to go back to the 20th century and be a professor. So um, what's a key moment for you in his development in season five that really changed him? I don't know if there's a key moment in Roger and what, what changes him or if it's like an accumulation of things. I mean, ever since he came back to the 18th century, it's just kind of been one huddle after another. And really his sort of primary objective was just to, 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 to help Brianna with whatever it was that she wanted to do, obviously, you know, with, with uh, Claire and Jamie and get back and get back to their time to, to, you know, to safety. So I think it was just a kind of a build up of everything right from the world go from the Gloriana onwards. But I suppose if you were to say, if you were to define a kind of catalyst, it would be the hanging. I mean, that just kind of brings everything together for Roger, I think. And after that, I think, I think what, what episode eight for me was, was he, he was kind of trying to find himself. He was on a, a journey of, kind of dis rediscovery. He was trying to get back to what he was before, before the hanging and, 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 and coming to the realization that he's never going to be the same person again. He is a changed man. And I think that's what's so great about the way the scene that was written with, with Brianna, where he, where he says, you know, you're just going to have to accept the fact that I'm no longer that person. I'm no longer the, the Roger that everyone loved so much and misses so dearly, I'm sure. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm changed from, from within and, I, and I, can't re I can't find that in me again. So I have to embrace the fact that it wasn't about healing. It was just, well, it was, but it's more about embracing the change that he's been through and the fact that he is coming out of the end of it a different man. Um, and yeah, so I suppose that's the, the sort of the, 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 the biggest catalyst for him. But I think that's an accumulation of everything that he's gone through to bring him to that point to say, this is how this time's changed me. This is how I'm a different man. I still love you very much. And I hope that's reciprocated, but um, I'm not going to be that that I'm not going to be exactly the same guy that you fell in love with. And I think that all sort of, I think that's encapsulated really nicely in that, in that scene where he says as much to Brianna. Well, Sophie, you know, they, they did discover when they tried to go through the stones and when they thought of home, that their home was with, was on Fraser's Ridge. So is she, has she now accepted that they are staying in this time? And, you know, she now is sort of comforting her mother in a way. So looking forward, um, what does she want going into season six? What does Brie want? I think for Brianna being in that time period, she almost felt a bit of a kind of juxtaposition within herself in that she very much is a modern woman for that time. And she, in that element, being an engineer in the 60s, 70s, she very much belongs in a modern time period. But then, yeah, she's never really had a full family. 
As I said before, her father died when he was younger. Claire and Brianna had a very strange relationship. Claire was working as a surgeon, which again is one of those relatable things we're talking about before. You know, a lot of women who don't get the time with the children that they would want, and we get to see how that that knock on effect happens and their relationships are estranged and she'd never met her real father. So for Brie, suddenly she has this family and even though brutal things have happened to her in this time period, it does almost then seem weird that she in a way seems almost safer there in some respects because her family are there. And obviously now that she has Jemmy, um, she wants a family that she never had for her child too. Um, and, you know, again, just touching on what Katrina and Sam were saying before, the phrases now have all experienced some form of sexual abuse and trauma. And I think it's one thing that I know sometimes people say, oh, without Lender, there's a, there's a lot of rape and there's a lot of X, Y, Z in terms of those things. And although obviously everybody is extremely sensitive to that, it's something that Diana put in the books because it, it did happen a lot, unfortunately, in those time periods. And I think what Diana and the writers have done incredibly is to show that as you were talking with the dissociation and everything else is that each of these traumas, the characters deal with them differently and they experience them differently. Um, you know, with Brianna, I had her go through something called tonic immobility, which is where your body essentially just goes completely numb. And they say that some people who experience rape in that way then have almost worse PTSD because they don't feel it at the time and they start to feel it later and later. So I think while we have all of these characters going through traumas and they all have immense empathy because they understand they understand what the others are going through. And even though Claire might not want to talk about it all the time and she's so bold and brave and she can say that she's going to be okay and she's trying to convince herself of that, Brianna knows exactly what she's going through. And we see that in that moment where Brianna sees Claire come off the cart. Because um, I think one thing that we, it's easy to overlook in that moment is that Brie doesn't actually know what's happened to Claire. No one's told her, but you can just, it's that almost sixth sense mother daughter thing. They've come so close now and so far and their relationship of mother and daughter kind of oscillates sometimes. And in that moment, it's like Brie's the mother to Claire and she knows that it probably broke Claire's heart the first time that Brie was going to go home. And now I think Brie, Brie stays there for herself and for her family. I think she knows that her mother's going to move her around for a while, even if she doesn't want to talk about her trauma. But um, for Brie, I think there's probably a bit of a relief that Roger thinking of home meant that that was home too. Because I think she felt very guilty keeping him there. But now that they're both on the same page, I think she'll start to be a lot more settled version of herself, I think, and yeah, just be that for a family. Well, Matt, with all of this set up, with this family bonded together uh, through love and through trauma, and facing this storm of the Revolutionary War, and also Claire having learned that there are more people traveling through time, uh, what can you hint about what we might see in season six coming up? Um, well, um, season six you know we're gonna we're gonna dig into the sixth book in the series and i i think one of the things that 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 we always dig into is that the frasers and the mckenzies put themselves out there the reasons why i think they they are so affected by traumas and and all the the the, the turmoil that goes on in the era is because they put themselves out there they try to help people and whether that's people coming to the ridge or them going out and trying to uh, stop something, whether it had been Culloden or Alamance or whatever, they, they, they put themselves out there, they put themselves at risk. And inherently when you do that, you know, you, you have to suffer, you, you suffer. And in book six, that happens again. And there's going to be um, joys, but you know, as Outlander, as, as Diana can uh, speak to this, there is going to be a drama, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be tears, um, uh, all of the above. And, and we're going to try to pull out of, you know, all those uh, really, uh, once again, they're always so dynamic. The, the story, we, where we get into problems, certainly in the writer's room is we fight over what scenes we want, you know, like, oh my God, this one's great. Let's, how do we work this in? to this episode or this episode or this episode. And sometimes that works to our advantage where we can go, oh, they're not gonna get it where they expect it, but it's gonna come down here and, and then it comes out of nowhere. And, and I think that's the, the fun of putting it all together because it's, it's very fun. Meryl has, you know, she has read all the books multiple times. She has her, her favorite scenes and, and she'll say, what about this one? And we're like, well, uh, maybe we can move it over here. And, and, and I never, and I never get my way. I never get my way. 
at, at first. Oh at first, God. she doesn't get her way. It's just a way of, and then she gets her way later. That's the way life works. Because it's it's such a luxury to get, and such an you know, amazing thing to have six seasons of of uh, of any TV series nowadays. And and so you know, knock on wood, that we get more. But you know, getting to book six was was for me, one of those things like, wow, this is, this is such a, an amazing thing that we can tell this story. And it's Meryl's favorite book. It's, I love so much in it. And, and I know that a lot of the fans that have read the book um, really like it too, so. Well, I'll just, we, we do need to wrap up soon, but I would love to go around and hear from everybody just quickly. What are you most excited about for getting back to shooting season six? <laughs> and Meryl, because you love the book so much, let's start with you. Uh, why do I have to go first? Um, I mean, it's hard to talk about the book without without spoiling things. But I, I mean, you know, the original Outlander is is obviously as well my favorite. But this is is my right second favorite because I think there's you know it's hard when you get to the sixth book. Uh, you know, as Matt said, usually you know we've been on a lot of television series and we know the ups and downs and um, you know you don't ma usually make it this far. Uh, but you know, and we're very lucky that we have so many of our original members with us. And, um, you know, we started with a crew of like six people in the writer's room and, and there's still four of us left. So it's, it's crazy to me. And, uh, you know, I, I just love this book because I think there's so much for everyone in it. I, I mean, Jamie and Claire, you know, um, you know, their love deepens, Roger and, and Rihanna, you know, they have their own journey and, and something, fun and new happens with them and uh and you know um Caitlin who who plays Lizzie has a great story and, and she's such a phenomenal actress there's just so many exciting things and I think um for all of us we're just excited to get back to work because as I said before we are truly a family we have our ups and downs we fight we bicker but we laugh and and uh you know I think we're all excited to see each other's faces again and get back to work and and make this show that we all love Cat, uh, what are you most excited about? Ooh, um, the, the food. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just so excited to see all of our crew, and you know, I, I think we we miss them all dearly, and it's it's really sad that everyone's you know not able to get up and go to work, and um, and maybe I'll get a haircut this season. I don't know. <laughs> light a lighter wig, maybe. Maybe, maybe. maybe. We'll very, see. very light. <laughs> I'll let Sam do it. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah. Sam, what about you? What are you excited about for playing Jamie in season six? Uh, I mean, first I'm excited there'll be no more Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> we can all agree to that, right? But uh, um, to, I mean, playing Jamie, I mean, yeah, to see where he, where he goes with this season. But to be honest, also, yeah, we have now six, almost seven years of, of experience behind us, right? We have scenes, we have characters, we have things in the books we haven't covered. We've, you know, we can call back on stuff and we've seen that there is time travelers out there as well. So yeah, it feels like the, the world, the universe is opening up a bit more and for us to draw upon as well, you know, for the writers and production team and as actors, we have all that experience and, um, and each other, you know, we, we know how each other works now and we enjoy most of the time uh, working with each other and it's it's brilliant I can't wait to go back to work honestly. Sophie what about you? Yeah you know as as we were saying before I feel like season five there's so much happened it's almost like every episode was its own little movie it was so fast-paced so it's exciting just to yeah go back and have so much more of that material I feel like thanks Diana pretty much everything that could happen to a person Brianna's pretty much been through um but I know that there's some even more stuff happening next season and it's just yeah it'll be exciting to see to see what we've got see what the writers do because it's always it's always amazing and i have a feeling it's going to be another absolutely packed season um and yeah seeing everyone's faces here i'm just like oh guys wish you all so it'll just be nice yeah to all be back together see the crew and everyone and we really are our own little family up in scotland so it'll be yeah good to get everyone back together if you can all come into the country that is so yeah my yeah. guys <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. uh, richard is uh, is roger ready for this revolutionary war Oh, absolutely, yes. No, I couldn't be more ready for the Revolutionary War. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I just can't wait to get out of the house, to be honest. I'm desperate to get back on, back on set. I truly, I can't wait to get back on set. It'll be, it'll be lovely. 
um, you know, infinite copious amounts of coffee, for example, seeing these guys again. Um, and actually, I have no idea what happens in book six because I haven't read it. So I think this will be the first time that I'll go on not knowing I have anything. four months. I know, but you know, I've been, really busy with other, I've been really, really busy with other things, you know. Um, oh, I'll, be bring your huh? I'll be excited. I'll be excited not to wear a wig and my cat. Yes. Thank you for growing your hair out. Yeah, you owe me. You owe me, man. I know. <laughs> That'll save on the budget, right? Yes, he will. Exactly why he's growing it out. I actually, I, you know, Sam I and I lost ours. It's Sam and I lost ours. I have this length, a few for them. It's difficult with having long hair. It's really, truly difficult. And it's, I it's know. Difficult. It goes yeah. by the marrow. You must you know, you know, It's example. so hard. It's so hard. I hate it. So bonus, bonus for me this season. You look great. You look great. <laughs> you all look fabulous. Diana, I, I want to close with you. Since, since Richard hasn't read the book, um, what, is, what is the most exciting, <laughs> like, what can you hint about um, this next book and, 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 should Richard be worried or happy or should he just pick that book up tonight? Mm -hmm. You've got a long time to work on it between <laughs> now and filming. So yeah, I agree that yourself. But uh, no, all I can say is what Mark Twain said when people said, how do you write your stories? They said, oh, it's easy. I just chase the characters up a tree and throw rocks at them. No, I'm looking forward, especially to just uh, seeing the first dailies. Is it's you know such a thrill to see you know what they've made of yeah, I have the story you know, in my head I know what happened but to see their take on it is fabulous and yeah you know, sometimes I think wow <laughs> that's really cool uh, both in terms of the acting and the set and so forth but particularly the acting you know because you know, these guys are magic they can do stuff that I would never ever have thought of no they are it's it's wonderful chemistry with this cast and I love to hear that you're still surprised by things that you see even All the in time. <laughs> Well, hey, thank you all so much. Um, thanks for joining us for this special PaleyFest conversation with members of the wonderful cast and creative team of Outlander. And thanks to the festival's official card, City. Uh, you can learn more about the Paley Center by visiting paleycenter.org. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.